chapter 16 this evening. Good evening, everybody. Welcome, uh, those of you joining us online and those of you here with us in person. Gospel of John, chapter 16 for Bible study tonight. So, the Gospel of John, of course, as we've gone through this, we've seen that John's purpose, he wants people to get saved, and so he tells us about the Savior. He emphasizes over and over again that Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is God in the flesh. He gave us his very purpose for writing when he said um, in chapter 20 and verse 31, these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. So the Gospel of John, being 21 chapters long, these past few weeks we've seen that starting in chapter 13 and even through tonight in chapter 16, we're still in those late hours in the evening of the Last Supper. Now, the Last Supper has already concluded, and they've left that upper room. But see how much of his book John dedicates to just this very last few hours of Jesus' time with his disciples before he goes to the cross. So far, we've covered three chapters, and we've still got a couple more to go, just in his last few hours with the disciples, and then we get to the crucifixion, and then, of course, the resurrection, which is the best part of the story. But this evening, we're going to be in chapter 16. As we get started tonight, let's pray. Uh, Reverend Brooks, would you please pray over the Bible study tonight? Heavenly Father, we're so thankful to be here in the Bible study, God. We ask you right now to open each heart of everyone that's here. Father, we ask you to bless Pastor Depotson as he teaches your word, God. And Father, let us continue to do your will. Have your way in this Bible study. We give you the praise, the honor, and the glory. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So chapter 16, beginning at verse 1, Jesus speaking. These things have I spoken unto you, that you should not be offended. Now when he's talking about not being offended, just as you would read in many other places in the Bible regarding being offended. Uh, even in the Psalms it says, they that love the law of the Lord, nothing shall offend them. It doesn't mean that if somebody utters a bad word or calls you a bad name, it doesn't take you back. What it means is that it's not going to offend you, as in put you off from following after God. Okay? He said, these things have I spoken unto you that you should not be offended. They shall put you out of the synagogues. Yea, the sh time shall come that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God's service. And these things will they do unto you, because they have not known the Father nor me. But these things have I told you, that when the time shall come, you, rem you may remember that I told you of them. And these things have I said not unto you at the beginning, because I was with you. So again, repeating that theme that we've seen through these chapters. He's telling them ahead of time that these struggles are coming, that these hard times are coming. That they're not taking him by surprise. So that when the hard times do come, when this very sudden event of him being taken in the garden and put up on the cross, when just a week ago they were acclaiming Sam, Sam saying, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Palm Sunday was just last week. How suddenly these events turn. They're not going to be offended because he's told them ahead of time. He's telling them over and over and over and over again from this Passover supper through this teaching as they're going to Gethsemane up to the time of his arrest. He's telling them it's about to happen. I know it's coming. Just because you see me being hauled away by the soldiers, don't think that it's out of my control because this is why I came. It's not taking God by surprise. He said... These things said I not unto you at the beginning. So you remember back to the earlier parts of the gospel, John and the previous gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and you can go back and read those about how Jesus was calling his disciples, and he called Peter and Andrew and James and John from their fishing boats, and he called Matthew from the table of the receipt of custom, and he called Nathaniel and Philip, they were friends, and he called them both to serve him, and one got in the other and, and brought them to Jesus. And you can see Jesus 
calling his disciples from the various places in their life where he encountered them and saying, come follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Come and follow me. Well, from that point when he said, come and follow me, he did not tell them everything that following him would entail. From the beginning, God did not tell any of us necessarily all of the trials that we would face in life serving God. Certainly not the most difficult things. Certainly not the things that perhaps would bring us to the very point of our faith. What would it have been if from the point that we believed, from that very infancy of our faith, God revealed to us what the greatest trials of our faith would be? Now perhaps some of us had an idea of what kind of trials we would face from the beginning. And I venture to say that for all of us, for all of us, the trials aren't over. What if what's coming is greater than what we faced thus far? And we don't have an idea of it yet. Perhaps that because, that's because God has been building us up to this point and telling us. Now, I'm not prophesying and I'm not bringing any doom down on anybody. I'm just saying that God told his disciples, I didn't tell you this from the start, but I'm telling you now as it's getting ready to happen. Because he knew what they needed was that growing process. He knew what they needed was that maturing process of that time spent with Jesus, that time learning from Jesus, that time hearing his preaching, seeing his demonstration of love, seeing his demonstration of power, just as all of us in our lives, before we're brought to the trials, we know God's love for us. Before we're brought to the trials, we know the power of God in our lives to keep us through whatever we've been through up to that point. So that when we get to the next hard trial, though it might have taken us by surprise, we say, okay, God knew this was coming, and I know that he'll see me through it. What if God told us from the beginning, not just in general terms, because when we get saved, we understand there's going to be sacrifices. When we get saved, we understand there might be some people that don't like the fact that I'm going to live right when they're living wrong. So in general terms, we can understand that there would be some persecution that we face. But what if God told us from the beginning everything we would face from the beginning. From the beginning, we wouldn't have the faith to follow him to the end. So God, in our lives, from the beginning, builds us, encourages us, strengthens us in that faith that we start with when we get saved. Just like he told them that faith starts as a mustard seed. Just as he told them in chapter 15 that we looked at last week, he is the vine, we are the branches, and we grow in him, and we produce fruit in him. Just as all of those other illustrations that he talks about, about growth and agriculture, our faith, our relationship with God is one of maturing so that the things that we go through is what God knows we're capable of going through at the time that he gives it to us. And he doesn't give us anything earlier than what we can bear it. So I'm saying all of that to bring it back to this. If you're going through something, it's something that God knows that you can get through. If you're going through something, it didn't take God by surprise. If you're going through something, it's what God says, you'll get through it just like you got through everything else by faith in him. Verse 5. But now I go my way to him that sent me. And none of you ask me, whither goest thou? Because I have said these things unto you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. So Jesus said, I've been telling you I'm about to go. Nobody's asked me, where are you going? They asked him in chapter 13, verse 36, why can't we follow you? They asked him in chapter 14, verse 5, how can we follow you if we don't know where you're going? But none of them asked him, where are you going? And he said, still, he skipped past that point. 
just to let them know that the benefit for them was the fact that he was going. Because by his going, he was going to send them the Holy Spirit after his departure. I just think it's funny. They didn't bother to ask, so at this point, he just said, I'll just tell you, it's for your benefit that I am going. And isn't that almost like what James said? You ask, or you have not, because you ask not. Jesus said, you didn't ask me where I'm going, so I'm, I'm just not going to tell you. I'll skip past that point. Just suffice it to know that I'm going, and it's for your benefit. But at this point, let's carry on to the next point. Verse 8, and when he has come, speaking of the Holy Spirit, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin because they believe not on me. Of righteousness because I go to my Father and ye see me no more. Of judgment because the prince of the world is judged. Speaking of the authority that the devil has in the world. Bible in, later on calls him the prince and the power of the air. How is it? Because you remember, God made Adam and Eve, set them in the garden, gave them dominion over the works of his hands. We're getting a little bit further than what I actually put into my outline by going into this. God made Adam and Eve, set them in the garden, gave them dominion over the earth, gave them dominion over the works of his hands, gave them one commandment, the easiest commandment in the whole Bible. The easiest commandment in the whole Bible, don't eat the fruit that's on that tree. Okay. I can do anything else. I cannot do anything else. The only thing that I can't do isn't something that's difficult to do or not to do. It's just don't go over there and eat the fruit. The easiest commandment in the whole Bible. So what did they do? They went over there and started gazing at it and wondering about it and admiring it. And because of their sense of awe over this forbidden fruit, the devil used that as the temptation, as the lure, their own enticement over it to say, uh, to deceive them about what God had said. And we know about that. But in their yielding to the devil, they yielded to the devil the authority that God had given them over the earth, okay? And there's a lot more that would go into teaching and understanding that, but that's why it says here, Jesus says the prince of the world is judged. Verse 12, but Jesus came, Jesus came, and that's also why in, when you see, especially in uh, Matthew, I believe, chapter 4, when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness and the devil took Jesus and set him on the pinnacle and said, I'll give you all of these kingdoms if you'll worship me. Well, it wouldn't have been a temptation if it was already something that Jesus had. Okay, Jesus came to redeem the world because it had been yielded by man. We're all born in sin. We have to redeem or Jesus redeems us when we believe on him, when we surrender ourselves to him, when we change camps, as it were, from where we were born, from our default position, to surrendering to Jesus to follow after him. Okay, so there's a lot that can be shown to establish that point. But Jesus says, I'm doing the work now that is going to secure the judgment of the prince of the world. Verse 12, I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them. Howbeit, when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you in all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and he shall show it unto you. He, uh, all things that the Father hath are mine, therefore I said, he shall take of mine, and shall show it unto you. A little while, and ye shall not see me. And again a little while, and ye shall see me, because I go to the Father. So what is it saying here? What is it saying here in verse 12 where Jesus is saying, I have many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. The disciples at this point realize, we, we need to realize, he's still teaching them 
before he's been arrested. They still, just hours, short hours before the event actually occurs, they still don't understand everything that's building up to that traumatic point, okay? Let alone everything that's going to happen after he rises and ascends and the Holy Spirit comes on the day of Pentecost, okay? They don't understand all of that yet, and so he tells them I, there's a lot more that's going to go on, but at this point, it's not going to make any sense to you. So what can we say? Looking back, the Bible's written so that we can know all of these things from our vantage point of what they experienced, okay, of what God gives us through his word so that we can see how it unfolded. What can we see looking back that they didn't understand from that vantage point short hours before the cross? Well, we know about the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, about how the Holy Spirit was poured out upon them. Okay? We know that Peter understood it to be the fulfilling of the prophecy in Joel, that the Spirit of God would be poured out upon all flesh. And we know that Jesus, before he ascended, he gave them the great commission, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. And then in Acts chapter 1, he told them, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, in the uttermost parts of the earth, extending the mission of the church globally, geographically, around the world. Jerusalem, where they already were. Judea, around the Jewish areas. Samaria, into the neighboring areas. And into the uttermost parts of the world. That means even as far as Louisiana. Amen. Amen. <laughs> and wherever you're watching tonight. As far as there are people, there is a mission for the church. Okay? But then Peter said, this is the promise for you and for your children and for your children's children. As many as are afar off, as many as the Lord our God shall call. So while Jesus, listen to this, Jesus extended the mission of the church globally in a geographic sense. Peter, speaking by the Holy Spirit, fulfill, in fulfillment of the prophecy from the Old Testament, stated that this promise for you, for your children, for your children's children, for as many as the Lord our God shall call, as many as are afar off, extended it not just to the ones that were alive today, in his day, not just to the ones that would be born after them, the generation following the apostles, but he extended it exponentially, generationally, as many as the Lord our God shall call. That means as long as there's still people getting saved, the Holy Ghost baptism is still for those people. So the promises of God, while they didn't understand, and people st t still today don't understand the fullness of the promises of God that are available to the believers, that are available to Christians, Jesus, by telling them this, puts it in here that we can see they didn't understand it. Just like we read in other places in the uh, New Testament, so that some of the prophets of the Old Testament didn't understand the fullness of what they were prophesying of. But we, from our vantage point now, with the Holy Spirit, can look back and say that's what they were talking about. Jesus said, I have many things to say unto you now, but you cannot bear them. What else? Did they not understand that the Gentiles, not just that the Jews from generation to generation would be the people of God, but that the Gentiles would be included with the chosen people of God, apart from, separate from, adherence to the law of Moses. Now, back in the Old Testament, they had the law of Moses, and it was signified in the, the, the male children by the, the token of circumcision, but there were other things that went into it about being separate from the world and the things that they would partake of and the sacrifices that they offered. And Gentiles could join themselves to the nation of Israel by joining themselves to the law of Moses and saying, okay, I will make myself a Jew, okay? But when the Holy Spirit came and was poured out and was available for all flesh, Gentiles were welcomed into the church on equal footing with the Jews. The apostles were all Jews. The Gentiles were welcomed in on equal footing with the Jews, separate, without having to go back and first meet these prerequisites of the law. The prerequisite is salvation in Jesus Christ. 
And that was demonstrated in Acts chapter 10 when Cornelius' household was saved and Peter saw them. He said that they, uh, he, he saw them, he went and preached to them and, and they believed and they were baptized in the Holy Spirit and then they were uh, baptized in water. And then in Acts chapter 15, the question was raised where, where James and Paul and Barnabas and all of the other apostles got together and said, well, what are we going to do about all of these Gentiles that are now getting saved? Do they have to know... Uh, do they now have to go and fulfill all of these tenets of the law of Moses? And then Peter said, well, wait a second. When I went and preached to Cornelius, God demonstrated that he accepted Cornelius in his household. Right. He proved it to me because I saw them get baptized in the Holy Spirit. I heard them pray in tongues, and they hadn't been circumcised. They hadn't fulfilled all of these tenets of the law. God just accepted them as they were when they believed on him. And that's how God accepts us. God accepts us by our faith. We don't have to fulfill any other prerequisites except believe on Jesus. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and they shall be, thou shalt be saved. And so the Gentiles are welcome, just as the Jews were welcome, just as Jesus said, I'm not come, but to the lost sheep of Israel. Yes, his mission was to start the church because it was fulfilling the prophecies that from the nation of Israel, the Messiah would arise. And they thought that the Messiah was just going to be their deliverer. That's why they hailed him. Uh, Blessed is he that comes in the name of the king, Hosanna. They thought that he was going to sit on the throne and, and overthrow Rome right there. And when he didn't, next week they cried, crucify him. And that's why when he rose in Acts chapter 1, you can see the disciples still asked him, are you going to restore Israel at this time? But what they didn't understand was that Jesus didn't come to be a political ruler on the earth. An earthly king at that time, what he came was to be the deliverer, not just of Israel, but of everybody that would believe on him. God's purpose is for the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, whosoever, doesn't matter if you're, if you're African, doesn't matter if you're Mexican, doesn't matter if you're American, doesn't matter what kind of can you came out of. I heard a preacher say that one time, and it was a lot funnier when he said it. That's why I don't <laughs> tell a lot of jokes because I just can't get the delivery right. But it's still true. It's still true. It doesn't matter where you came from. In Revelation, it says, I saw a great multitude. Yes. A great multitude. And I believe it said, I believe it said a mixed multitude. That means they weren't segregated. Okay? I saw a great multitude from every tribe, every tongue, every nation. Praise God. But they needed the Holy Ghost to understand that. And so he said, you'll understand it when the Holy Ghost comes. That's why I'm going to go and then send the Holy Ghost. Verse 19. Uh, verse 17. Then said some of his disciples among themselves, What is this that he saith unto us a little while? And he shall not see me, and again a little while, and ye shall see me, because I go unto the Father. And they said, therefore, what is this that he saith a little while? We cannot tell what he saith. Sometimes you get people, instead of asking, what do you mean? They discuss among themselves, what do you think he means? Verse 19. Now Jesus knew that they desired to ask him. And he said unto them, do you inquire among yourselves of that I said a little while and you shall not see me and again a little while and you shall see me? Verily, verily, I say unto you that you shall weep and lament. It means you're going to be great sorrowful. We all know what weeping means and lamenting. But the world shall rejoice. You shall be sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned to joy. A woman, when she is in travail, hath sorrow because her hour is come. But as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish for the joy that a man child is born into the world. And ye now therefore have sorrow. But I will see you again, and your heart shall rejoice, and your joy no man shall take from you. So again, he's telling them beforehand that they were going to experience great grief, great sorrow from what they were about to experience. But their grief was going to be worthwhile in the end. Right. Just like 
pregnancy. Now I'm a father, not a mother. Okay, so all of the all of the grief of pregnancy that I experienced was secondhand, <laughs> and I I greatly admire those women who do faithfully raise their children and 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 knowing that they got uh, went through so much to bring them in the world will 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 bear along with them in, in great patience to continue to raise them, uh, especially those that would raise them to serve the Lord. But just like pregnancy, he said that, that a woman, Jesus said this, God said this, because God's the one that knows how hard it is for a woman to raise a child, to bear a child especially. He told Eve that it was going to be that way. But he said just like a woman who's giving birth, she's, she's experiencing all this pain, but the moment that the child is brought to her and laid there on her chest and she cradles it, that pain for, for a little bit, okay, because a little while later, when the child's you know sleeping and recovering, and especially when the child starts giving her a hard time, she says, "Do you know how much of a hard time you gave me a couple of years ago?" Anyway, <laughs> but when that child is brought to her, she said, "It was all worth it. It was all worth it. Look at this little baby that I'm holding now. This is my child." And Jesus said, "You're going to go through a lot right now, and it's going to be hard, and it's going to be painful." And you're going to say, what is this all about? But then it's going to be worth it. It's going to be worth it. Verse 23. And in that day you shall ask me nothing. In that day you shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever you shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Hitherto you have asked nothing in my name, Ask, and you shall receive, that your joy may be full. These things have I spoken unto you in Proverbs, but the time cometh when I shall no more speak unto you in Proverbs, but I shall show you plainly of the Father. At that day you shall ask in my name. I say not unto you that I will pray the Father for you. For the Father himself loveth you, because ye have loved me. And have believed that I came out of the Father. I came therefore from the Father, and I'm come into the world again. I leave the world and go unto the Father. So what is this? In verse 23, he said, you shall ask the Father. In verse 26, he said, I say not unto you that I will pray the Father for you. For the Father himself loveth you. There's no separation between us and God. Some people would say, I need somebody. I need to be able to pray to somebody that can ask God for me. I need to be able to pray to somebody that can uh, beseech God on my behalf for this petition. But Jesus said, you shall ask the Father. You shall ask the Father. Jesus said, I say not unto you that I will pray the Father for you. Jesus said, you don't even have to ask me to ask the Father because you're already in me. For the Father himself loveth you. And you have believed. We've already believed on Jesus. Our place in God is already established. That's why he said, in Hebrews chapter 4, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace. In Ephesians, it says that we're seated together with him in heavenly places. Our rightful place as believers, as Christians, is with God. And I'm not casting stones at anybody who was brought up with a tradition, but I'm saying that this is what Jesus said. He said, you shall ask the Father. And so I'm going to challenge you. I'm going to challenge you. If you were brought up with a tradition. What's the tradition? Do you want me to? Praise God. In, in, in the Catholic faith, people are taught 
And I'm not casting stones. I'm explaining. I was raised Catholic. Okay, I'm not casting stones because a lot of my family, a lot of my family is, is Catholic. Okay. That's fine. I'm, I'm, like I said, I'm not casting stones. But in the Catholic faith, people are taught that saints in heaven, you can ask a saint in heaven to pray to God for you. I know. And for certain things, patron saints, for certain things, you can ask. Uh, for instance, I'll give, a, I'll give a very specific example. For instance, um, I lost something one time, and it was just a couple of months ago. I lost something one time, and it was such an important thing that I called a neighbor to help me look for it. And, and while she was helping me look for it, and she was helping my wife look for it, uh, we eventually found it. But when we found it, she said, I prayed to St. Anthony, the finder of lost things. Okay? And I'm not casting stones because she helped. And I'll tell you this, I'll even confess this. While I was worrying about finding this, she was praying. Okay? So, let it be a lesson to pray rather than worry because I was worried about this thing that I had lost. But nevertheless, people are taught, pray to this saint or pray to Mary or ask somebody who's already in heaven to go to God and ask him for you. But Jesus is saying you don't have to do that. Jesus is saying you can ask God because God already loves you because your place before God is already in him. Yeah, I was yeah. only taught that. I wasn't taught to ask anybody else besides God. That's great because that's what Jesus says to do. And again, not casting stones, but I'll challenge you that if that was the way you were taught and if that's your practice, that tonight you make a special prayer. Say, God, I want to know what it means to pray to you and to know that you are going to answer my prayer. Not because somebody else that I'm counting on will intercede for me, but because I trust in Jesus as my Savior and I know that you love me. I was taught not to ask him about that. So I mean, Amen. Amen. That's a blessing. But you That's, see, I wasn't. Right. Okay. I was raised Catholic. I mean, from a little. Yes, ma'am. Come on, South Louisiana. Right, and, and it's... it's Dad kiss them everything. It's the way that a lot of people are raised and taught. And there are a lot of traditions that people are brought up with in different denominations, in different churches. But what we do in Bible study is we get into the Word of God and we say, is this what Jesus says? Is this what the Bible says? Because doesn't matter what church you're a part of, doesn't matter what denomination you were raised in. As Christians, it's our responsibility and it ought to be our delight to draw closer to God by getting into his word and saying, this is how I can live better for him. Amen. And if Jesus says, if Jesus says, ask the Father. Ask the Father. If Jesus says, ask the Father then ask the Father. Praise God. But there was a time I didn't know that. That's right. <laughs> you know, and, but I'm grateful today right. I did. Amen. Amen. And I thank God for that. I'm Amen. Glad that, I'm glad that that was brought up. I've never been told that. Okay. Ever. Okay. Well, praise God. And you know, I was just told, praise Jesus. But we each, praise each God. one of us, whether we grew up with that understanding of how prayer works or how, how intercession with the saints works. That might not have been something that we were brought up with. I wasn't, because I wasn't, lots of my cat, uh, family is, but I was not raised Catholic. But we still have things that though we might have been brought up with it, we still have the responsibility with our own understanding by the Spirit of God to get into the Bible and say, even if this was something that I was brought up with, if the Bible shows me that this is the right way, then I've got to conform to the right way. And through Bible study, through the preaching of the Word of God, through prayer, through the preaching as the Spirit of God speaks to our hearts, a lot of times we're going to catch ourselves saying, I need to make this adjustment in my life. And that's what we do as Christians. We make the adjustment in our life. We don't say, well, that's what the preacher says. He showed me in the Bible. God was kind of dealing with my heart about it, but I felt uncomfortable about it, so I'm just going to go back to the way that I've always done it. No, it's our obligation before God to conform to what he's showing us through his word. Amen. 
Verse 29. His disciples said unto him, Lo, now thou speakest to us plainly. I'm just going to finish up this chapter really quickly. I know I'm running a little bit long. Verse 29. His disciples said unto him, Lo, now thou speakest to us plainly. Thou speakest no proverb. Now we are sure that thou knowest all things, and needest not that any man should ask thee. By this we believe that thou camest forth from God. And Jesus answered them, Do you now believe? Now. Now you believe. Behold, the hour cometh, yea, is now come, that you shall be scattered. And now you believe. Every man to his own, and you shall leave me alone. And now you believe. He said, and yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. Amen. These things have I spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And that is a promise, just as much as it was to the eleven that he was speaking to, as it is to us today. In this world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Amen. And we're going to see when we get next week into chapter 17 that these promises that he was making to the 11 applied just as much to them as to us. Right. Chapter 17, he makes that very clear. Father, we thank you that we can come to you, that our place in Jesus by faith and the work that he has done in, in removing any separation between you and those that have faith in you, that we can come to you knowing that you hear our prayers, knowing that you answer our prayers because you love us. We thank you that you sent your son to give us salvation. And by that salvation, also having that, uh, that promise to receive your Holy Spirit. We pray that you would keep your hand upon us, Lord, as we each go from this place our own separate ways. But bring us back again at the appointed time where we will once again meet together in your presence. But during that time of separation from one another, Lord, we know that your spirit will be present with each one. Help us to use that time to seek you, God, to draw closer to you through your word, through prayer, and that we can each draw closer to you, walking by your side, pleasing unto you, to honor you, to reach somebody else for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you this evening. I'm so glad I came because I, I, God.